So, Jerry, when did you first become interested in aviation? Well, it's kind of a long story because my father had a model airplane shop. And from the time I can remember, we had model airplanes. And then my dad did a flight course on the GI Bill. But he would never take me because he was superstitious. But I always wanted to fly because I'd done model airplanes for so long. And it was, it was good fun. I liked uh, scale models. I did a lot of 172nd scale wooden models. And I don't like plastic models at all. I just would just always do the, the wooden model and so forth. And then I had a chance when I was a young sailor, I was hitchhiking back from Oklahoma City to the base in Norman, Oklahoma. And I run into a, a guy who had an airfield and took me for a ride. That was my first ride in an airplane. That was in 19, ooh, what, 1959, back in the days when it was Buddy Holly and, <laughs> and all of those folks. And it was, it, was, it was really good fun. And it was a Cessna 150 that he took me up in for about a 20, 30 minute ride. Not bad. And I never flew again until I got, as a sailor, flew in the back seat or in the back of the carrier on board delivery airplanes and on first on USS Lexington and then on USS Hancock. So I did a number of those. So I had some experience because I was an aviation electronics technician in the Navy, having joined at age 17 mm -hmm. and uh, had a great time, great time. So what year did you join the US Navy? I joined the Navy in 1958, uh, just Came right out of high school in July 10th, 1958. That was me up and away. <laughs> so could you tell us some of the aircraft you started training on? Well, once I became a pilot, the first aircraft that I flew in was the uh, T-34 uh, Mentor. And that was the basic trainer for the U.S. Navy. And both pipelines, whether it was a jet pipeline or a mini motor or a helicopter pipeline, uh, started out in the T-34. From there, I went to the T-2A, which was a single-engine trainer, jet. And then from there, I went to the T-2B, which was a two-engine uh, jet trainer. Uh, and we used that for carrier qualifications. And I did my first carrier qualification on the USS Lexington down in Pensacola, Florida. And that was done in about 1967, early 1967. And what was that like? Well, it was scary to start with, but then when I'd been enlisted, I'd landed on a carrier in the back of this carrier onboard delivery airplane, a C-1, and that, when we landed on it, the, the noise of the tires went bump, 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 which we had wooden teak decks, and the tires were causing the, the, the teak to, to oscillate or vibrate. When I did my first care call, the first thing you did is you did a, a, a hookup, two hookup passes. And on the first one, it went, the airplane went bump, 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 bump. And I was very comfortable from then on. And then I went from basically Pensacola to advanced jet over in Kingsville, Texas, where I was flying the single seat F9F, uh, I think it was F9F8, and also the two seat trainer as well, or the two seat fighter. Uh, F9, and those were axial flow engines, or excuse me, centrifugal flow engines. So they were a bit slower, a little bit, a little bit underpowered. The T2 actually was quite good because it had axial flow engines, and that was a, quite a nice airplane to fly for as a trainer. From there, I went to uh, San Diego. I was selected for fighters, and went to San Diego to fly Phantoms. And the first thing I did is spent 26 hours flying um, the TA-4 uh, for instrument training. And that's what they did with all the pilots that came from the training command, is the first thing they did is they give you a, an extensive upgrade on your instrument conditions. And then I started flying the Phantom. I, I've flown all, about 10 versions of the Phantom. I started, I, the first one I flew was an F-4A, and then most of the time I was in an F-4B, and then flew F-4Js. Uh, the first cruise I was on was F-4Bs, second cruise was F-4Js. Had a little bit more powerful engine, a little bit different engine, had a better radar in the F-4J, and uh, had the AUG-10 radar for, for that, and that was a, excellent. And from there, I went, I went in Kerkwald uh, on the Phantom, on the Ranger, and from there I went to the Constellation, 
when we deployed, and then I did two cruises on Constellation, amassing about 330 carrier landings all told on Connie. A lot, <laughs> a lot of fun. <laughs> I can imagine. So could you tell us what the Phantom was actually allowed to fly? Actually, it was, it was a little bit on the touchy side. Um, you had to make certain your stability augmentation was working. And you, you had to be careful you didn't end up with what they call a PIO or a pilot-induced oscillation. And if you're a little ham-fisted ham -fisted, or you didn't keep the airplane trimmed up, you could get yourself into mischief with that. And it just would pitch up and down quite severely. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it never happened to me. I always flew the airplane in trim or tried to keep it in trim and so forth. And that just kept things going. It was a very, very fast airplane. You could do Mach 2 with a clean airplane. Generally, we flew around 450 knots. 420 knots was kind of the corner speed. You could take it to maximum G at 420. And that's uh, calibrated air speeds that they had in the F4. And it was, uh, it was just good to fly, you know, it's just good oh, to fly. And uh, we generally flew around uh, 20,000 feet, 15,000 feet, depending on the combat mission we were on. And then uh, doing night dive bombing, that was exciting. <laughs> and uh, and so forth. So can you tell us about your first operational squadron on the Phantom? That was VF-142, uh, the Ghost Riders, and my first skipper was uh, uh, Billy Franklin, um, and it was a, a really good squadron. It, we had 34 officers in it. We had uh, um, we have 14, 14 air crew uh, uh, pilots and 14 uh, radar intercept officers, so we had 28 air crew uh, as part of the squadron. And then uh, another six or so officers that did intelligence officer and maintenance officer and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it was a it was a very progressive squadron, and and we were we were well trained in the VF 120, 121, which was a replacement rag. But we did a lot of practicing when we left San Diego uh, on my first cruise in '68 in the, the June of '68. We went and did a lot of operations around Hawaii. And that was really of good value. Not a good bad value. location. Not a bad location. <laughs> so was the squadron mainly air to ground or air to air? Well, we were predominantly air to air. Our mission was on the ship was either bar cap or tar cap. Um, bar cap is barrier air combat patrol. Tar cap was target air combat patrol. And it depended on what the mission was. About a third of my missions were at night out of 221 combat missions. About a third of them were at night, and about a third of them were air to ground. Uh, some daylight, mostly night, air to ground, dropping bombs. 500 pounders, tickers. We had uh, mines that we would lay as well, and so forth. So what would you say the best role for the F-4 at this time was? Well, I think that it was as good a bomber as anybody out there with just fixed, fixed sights. But it really was air to air, because we had forward-looking radar, we could launch a we could launch a Sparrow missile uh, from some distance, and it was good. The, the problem was with forward looking, is you had to identify your target before you could shoot. That takes the forward looking out, because you have to intercept it and make certain that they are bad guys, and not good guys that aren't responding properly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I want to know: Can you remember your first trap on on a carrier with the F four? Yes, it was, uh, it, it was exciting, uh, but it was, it was relatively easy. The airplane, in the landing configuration, you could, you could walk the throttles because we had two things. If you kept it trimmed up, you had very high-speed responding engines, and you could walk the throttles, and you got two things out of it. You got a little bit of extra thrust when you pushed it forward. Also, you got boundary layer control on it, so you could almost fly the airplane in a stair step coming down, and you could trim that thing up, and it was just rock solid, and it was it was really good to land on the carrier. The Brits, when I flew with the Brits, they screwed that up a bit because they took away the axial flow engines, uh, the J-79 engines. They took those out and put in Rolls-Royce Spey engines, which were fan engines, which changed the characteristics mm -hmm. of flying the airplane altogether, especially in the landing configuration because you always seemed like you'd always either have too much or too little on the throttle, and as you put throttle on it, there's get that inherent lag that you get in a fan engine, then all of a sudden it would come on and you might climb a little bit or drop a little bit depending whether it was on or off. So, 
But I, th I thought that the, the F-4 landing was excellent. So how did the F-4 fare in DACT with the aircraft of that time? We were, we kind of dogfight, we did, the dogfight mode in the, in the F-4 was like an Easter egg. And what it was, was energy conservation and energy management. And in comparing us with other aircraft of the day, MiG-21, MiG-17, uh, some of the other follow-on airplanes, we actually had places where we were very, very good. And we had some places where we didn't want to get slow with them. Our low handling, low speed handling characteristics were not that great. You know, below about 330 knots, you were kind of struggling to get any kind of G on the airplane at all. Like you say, our corner velocity was around 420 indicated or calibrated, and that you could pull to seven, seven plus Gs in that. You know, so it was very good. You just flew the airplane where you wanted to fly. And that was one of the things we got with Top Gun. Top Gun, I was in the very first Top Gun class, and the purpose of Top Gun was to teach you how to fight the Phantom. So they sent two pilots in and two backseaters. You went through the, the course, it was about six weeks long. You then went back into the squadron, and you flew with all the other pilots in the squadron, taking what you'd learned from Top Gun and showing them and getting them a higher level of proficiency as a fighter pilot in the Phantom. And it worked. It worked very well. Before Top Gun, our kill ratio was 4 to 1. After Top Gun, it was 11 to 1. There you go. The numbers don't lie. That's right. So, Jerry, can you f remember your first combat mission over Vietnam? Yeah, it was uh, daytime. Uh, the, way this, the way we operated, we would come into the out of port, whether it, we'd been out for a while or not. But the first day out was really, really good to, to do because it was a day mission, and we were flying, fundamentally, we were doing air-to-air. -air. And so it was maybe the third or fourth mission before I actually did an air to ground. Okay. But it was it was air to air. We were doing combat air patrol, the barrier air patrol, and that's what we did is we went out there and you learned all the procedures and the things like that. Practice tanking to make certain we were up to speed with tanking. When we first started out in F4Bs, we in, in, in our configuration, we would fly with just a center line tank on. And so we were flying generally around an hour and a half sorties. Mm. And you might do some tanking, you might not. Later on, when we went into a peace operation, we had all kinds of tanks on the airplane. And so you'd fly a two hour mission instead of an hour and a half. Mm. So it was, but the first, first missions, they were, it was, it was really exciting because there you are, you are in combat. You don't know if a bad guy is gonna come out. And you'd hear them on the radio, they'd come out and you'd, whenever the MiGs were airborne, there would be an announcement on guard letting us know that there were bandits, bandits, uh, bullseye 22, and that give you a location as to where they were. Uh, we were, generally we would be holding about 30 miles, 25 to 30 miles off the course, mm -hmm. uh, off the coast. And, uh, and traditionally we would be up, running just up by Hainan uh, and on up just past Haiphong and then turning around and coming down, down to probably about Vinson and then turn it around. So we were doing probably about 25, 25 to 45 mile legs, depending on yeah. what was going on, whether it was nighttime or daytime and so forth. Mm -hmm. So what kind of air to ground um, ordnance would you be carrying at this point? Well, we either had 500 pounders, uh, just a regular 500 pound uh, Mark 82, or we would have uh, tickers. We would have the type of uh, uh, 500 pounder with a, with a, uh, um, a head on it that would allow it to hit the ground and penetrate, and then any magnetic interference that would come by, any trucks that would come by, it would go off automatically. Uh -huh. And it was also set up very neatly that when the battery got to its half-life, it would explode the bomb. Mm -hmm. So we weren't leaving for future years tickers in the ground that you know people would find. Then the other thing we dropped on occasion, depending on if we were doing uh, Flax suppression or something, we'd have rock eyes. You know, if we were doing a bark or a tar cap where we were a target combat air patrol, uh, we would have maybe rock eyes on as well as our missiles. And we would have generally four sidewinders 
and two Sparrow missiles on the machine. So what was life like on board at this point between all the crews? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was actually very good. Uh, they were pretty relaxed with us. Uh, um, you know, I wore fatigues around the carrier and, and we ate well too because we'd have the, 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 what they called the dirty shirt wardroom was, was set up to feed you 21 hours. Of course, it was all breakfast, but but it is still you got you could have you could eat for twenty one hours a day, and it was it was good. Your your accommodation. When I was a, a junior, ten a junior grade, I was in a four man bunk room, and that was a grin a minute. I mean, there were antics and tricks going on all the time, and uh, and then once I made lieutenant, then I was in a two man stateroom, and it was very good. You know, you had bunk beds, you had. Uh, you had your stereo. I had a I had an aquarium. I had a 15 gallon saltwater aquarium in That's my. That's the first I've heard. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, but I had to get permission from the damage control central that I could have seven gallons of water that far above the uh, the meta center of the carrier because they didn't want me destabilizing anything. <laughs> <laughs> so was that for the main aircraft in Vietnam? Would you say? For for the U.S. Navy, it was the it became the the main fighter. We had F eights out there at the same time, uh, Crusaders, but for for us in our operation it was primarily the Phantom. Uh, we might be operating with maybe three carriers, and if we were operating with three carriers, one of them might be a uh, might have F eights on them, but the others would all, and that was kind of unusual. But at at the end game, it was always always only F fours mm -hmm. for fighters. So what other aircraft were on board at this time? You had, for light attack, you had the Skyhawks, the A-4 Skyhawk. And then after that, we got the uh, uh, F-A uh, Corsair two, And uh, then we had uh, Helos on board. We had, uh, um, trying to remember the name of them, the SH-3 uh, Sea King. And another one, a smaller one, which we used for unwrapping and for sending stuff over to the to the destroyers and things like that, we had the C two, which was an early warning mm -hmm. aircraft, a radar early warning. Uh, what else did we have? We had the Whale, which was the A three Sky Warrior, which was a big two engine, a huge airplane, and we had that, and that was our tanker. Then we had the A six Intruder, nice. and that was a that was our heavier strike airplane because they could carry I don't know twenty four or twenty eight. 500 pounders and, and not even blink. You know. So was so, there for the new aircraft on the carrier this time? Pretty much. Uh, we were the newer, we were the newer ones. What well, the A7 was a new airplane because yeah. that was, that was, that came out and replaced the A4 Skyhawk. And uh, the A6 was probably similar vintage to the, to the, uh, to the F4. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was new. It was, that was in 19, I went on my first cruise in 1968. The F-4 had been around since like 1958 mm -hmm. and slowly through its development cycle and so forth. And then you had one very memorable mission. Could you talk us through this? Well, from start to finish, yeah. yeah. It, it, this was on the, it started around the 25th, 24th of March, 1970. There was a lot of activity going on the MiGs were up flying around, they were coming out over the water, and there was other issues going on with them chasing after um, the unarmed reconnaissance airplanes. We had That was another airplane we had on the carriers too, which was the Vigilante, uh, which was, they had it rigged for doing ground photographing, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So anyway, there was a lot of activity, and my backseater, Steve Barkley, bless his heart, he was the schedules officer. And I kept trying to get them to schedule us on a one thing. And all the people who were going out flying were the, the skipper, the XO, the maintenance officer, the ops officer. They were all leading the flights. And the, the younger guys weren't getting a chance to come out because we're they were setting up and there was a lot of activity. We had to strengthen our, our combat air patrol going on up in, the, up in the top of the Gulf. And in the particular day, the 28th of March, the the day before, the 27th of March, the our sister squadron, uh, VF-143, the Pukin Dogs, or the, the Sands Reproach, they went in and they screwed up their intercept and didn't bag anything. 
the next day, the 28th of March, the closest I got to, to being up on the flight deck, I was the Alert 5. That was as close as I could get. Everybody else, the skipper, the XO, everybody was airborne, the maintenance officer, da 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 da, da. I was Alert 5. Alert 5 meant that I sat in my airplane for two hours, able to launch in five minutes or less. All of a sudden, on the flight deck, the XO was late coming in, and his airplane was on the catapult, and they pushed him off and they shouted, launch the Alert 5. And that was me. Off and rutted. Joined up. They asked me how my weapon was. I said, my weapon is sweet. And then I got up and I joined with the air group commander as his wingman, and they give us vectors in at two MiGs coming out. And at this point, what uh, payload were you carrying? I had four sidewinders. No, I had three sidewinders and two sparrows and three tanks. And so I was burning, burning the wing tanks down, uh, trying to get them empty, because that was the first thing that I could jettison would be my wing tanks. So we were coming in at about 20,000 feet. The MiGs were up around 25,000 feet. I spotted them. And in the flight, there's, you can have two leaders. You've got a military leader and a tactical leader. And one of the things they taught you in Top Gun was to be the tactical leader. And I took charge, called the flight, called the turns, got us engaged with the MiGs. I got slow on the first turn at the top. I was down around 3.30 or something. And so the MiG went, went past me and down. I, I slid it down underneath them and went all the way down. I got back up to around 650 knots. And climbing back up into the fight, and he went back up high. He didn't go nearly as, didn't speed up nearly as much as I did. So I'm coming back up, and I met him at the top. But coming up, Barkley says, tanks. Reach down, blow the tanks. Up we go. And there, I join him at the top. The MiG is coming down in a right-hand turn. I'm coming in a, in a right-hand turn, and I'm sliding in behind him. And as I went in behind him, I think he thought I was going to overshoot, and he reversed. And I reversed with him, got a sidewinder tone. Barkley's in the back seat. He's out, shoot, shoot, shoot. I shot him. And then every war movie I've ever seen, you shoot the guy and he blows up. Yeah. Okay? The missile came off at the lead lag, goes off to the inside, comes back to the outside, comes back up, big puff of gray smoke, and that's what you get when the sidewinder blows up. Explodes. He didn't blow up. The airplane, the MiG didn't blow up. I was devastated. I went into what they call as a high yo-yo because I was overtaking them really fast. And I shot almost at mid-range. Mid and I went right up vertical. And then as I went up, because now what I'm doing is I'm saving energy and saving tactical advantage because I'm on, on his flight path, but I'm on, doing a high yo-yo. He flops over and the fire is just coming out of him. I came, rolled over the top again, and I shot him again. And that was how I wanted to make damn certain I got him. <laughs> So down he went, and he never got out. And then by now, the wingman had got away, and CAG was chasing the wingman. And I called CAG, and he says, we'll RTB, we'll go feet wet. So that was it. The engagement was over with. I got my MiG. The only thing I could say is when we got out over to the water, I said, did you see him? Yes. I'm confirming your kill. It was great. And that, and that was it. Now... We've got another hour and 20 minutes before we can go back and land because the ship's not ready for us because we're just swanning about. And I can see that I don't quite have enough fuel to be at, at minimum fuel for landing. It's going to be really close. So I said, well, we need a tanker. And so they got us a tanker and we tanked. We took out a couple thousand pounds and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, but that was it. And it was a cloudy day. No, no low pass on the ship, anything, and it, you just landed, and, and it, it was, then everything, of course, the whole ship is alive, mm. and the briefings and the debriefings were absolutely wonderful, and the skipper of the, of the carrier, he brought up a bottle of brandy Very nice. to, to give us, we'd all had a little drink, brandy, and that was, that was really cool, and that was it, and uh, as a result of that, um, the Class, it was a classic dogfight from, a, from a, a Top Gun point of view. That We did everything absolutely right. We shared we, information and so forth. 
And they took that kill, the whole details on, on my kill, back to Washington, and they got Top Gun set up as a proper full command. From that? From that. Wow. We went on then. I got the first kill as a, as a Top Gun graduate. When they went back in in 1972, when Nixon sent everybody in to get the POWs loose, there was five or six Top Gun guys that got killed in that. And, and we just went on to acquit ourselves. And it was very, very good. And it's, the Top Gun is still going today. It's mm -hmm. called Fighter Weapons School now. But it's still Top Gun. It's still Top Gun. I think that's what knows it as, yeah. Yeah. And it, and it was very good. In the movie, of course, the movie, all of the flying, that, that people don't often realize if they've never been in the game, all of the flying that they were doing with Maverick and, and uh, they're maneuvering against one another, that's real. Not flying upside down over, your, over the bad guy. That's no. not real. <laughs> okay. But, but the rest of the stuff was, was, was for real. The maneuver that he, where he pulled up in Top Gun and reduced power and lost his speed, that's a kill self maneuver. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't work, you've just given away all your energy, yeah. and the guy's still behind you, and he's just going <laughs> to shoot you easier. Yeah. You know? So it's one of those things. That, yeah. that's, that's one of the, two th the, the, the flying upside down over the top of the bad guy, and then that maneuver to push the guy ahead of you. Those are the two bad things in that in that entire movie. Looks good I in think. the film, though. <laughs> yeah, it looks good in the film. Yeah. So how long did that engagement last? Oh, I did two and a half terms with the, turns with the guy. I'd say probably six or maybe seven minutes. Did it feel like that at the time? Oh, no. No. No, I had bruises on both hips <laughs> from jumping up and down afterwards. But it, it just seemed so fast. And we'd practiced that stuff. Steve Barkley and I had practiced a lot on engagements and stuff. And so our, our crew discipline was very good. No shouting, nothing, you know, it just uh, very calm. And you'd think we'd been doing it a hundred times instead of just the, the first time. Mm -hmm. But they were really, really disciplined. And the voice, listening to the voice tapes afterwards, very calm. You wouldn't know that we were right in the middle of a dogfight for the first time in my whole life. Mm -hmm. So... And it was just, it's just all because of the practice, because of Top Gun, because of the practice. And then maybe some just, without sounding too cocky, just some good mental state and discipline, you know. But it was, a, it was a marvelous day, 28th of March, 1970. Something you'll never forget. I'm never, sure. no. And Steve and I we exchanged emails or telephone calls on that day to each other. I can imagine, yeah. yeah. So was, how maneuverable was the MiG-20 then? Actually, it was a very good airplane, uh, MiG-21. It's a Mach 2 airplane as well. Um, they, one of the drawbacks from it was is that it had a delta wing, and if you lost the speed, it took more time to get the speed back on. The second thing was is that it, uh, the visibility out of the back of the, the MiG was terrible. Mm -hmm. And if you ever look at a, at a, because they've got them in museums around and stuff, you look at one, imagine sitting in the cockpit and trying to turn, and you couldn't look more than about just past 90 degrees into the tail section. Whereas with the Phantom, you could reach forward, grab onto a mirror, and pull yourself around and see almost directly into your six. Mm -hmm. It was, it was made. Phantom would have been better if we hadn't worried so much about going Mach 2, then put a little bit of a bubble canopy on yeah. the thing, and you could see. Six weeks, or two months ago, three months ago now, I flew the two-seat Spitfire, and that's got kind of a bubble canopy on it. So you could sit and look right back and see your tail. You yeah. could look dead into your six o'clock, and it was, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. So how many missions did you get all together? 221. Uh, 220 in F-4s and one in an OV-10. Wow, oh, an OV-10. An OV-10. I went down to Da Nang and went out with one of the... Uh, uh, Air, uh, the forward air controllers out and they were calling in strikes in and I went out in the back seat of an OV-10 to have a look at, at, at that. Oh, wow, okay. That was a fun airplane. I went, uh, later on in Pax River, I went on to fly the OV-10 quite a bit and I quite enjoyed flying it. I wouldn't want to do it in combat because <laughs> it, it was a little under, underpowered. Mm -hmm. If you have lo loaded up with a lot of ordnance, it was underpowered. All right, one of the things at Top Gun, this was, I, I think, is really important because it was brand new. And what we were flying, we were flying our own airplanes. 
We were flying, the, 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 for my case, I was flying the F-4B, and we were flying against a lot of different other kinds of airplanes. And although we'd had dissimilar engagements in the past, this was much more realistic because you had very high caliber pilots flying the aggressor airplanes. And so we were flying against all different kinds of things. The A-4 Skyhawk was very much like a MiG-17. Mm -hmm. And they had the, the F-5, which was much like the MiG-21 mm -hmm. in terms of performance and reactions and stuff like that. So you flew against those things. And then folks would come down, we'd go fight against the A-6s, and we'd fight against anybody that would come out and play. The F-8, we were flight, fighting all the time. Mm -hmm. And then the Air Force sometimes would send airplanes down, Phantoms from March and uh, F-100s and things from around the bazaars, and we'd get a chance to fight against them too. And that was good. But also within Top Gun, we put everything on the airplane that the airplane could carry. You'd, you'd do different missions. We were doing uh, strafing missions. So we had, we had a uh, uh, General Electric Gatling gun on the belly in place of the centerline tank. Mm -hmm. And we, we did some air-to-air -air against a drone uh, or against a, uh, uh, a towed banner to see if we were any good at just eyeballing and, mm -hmm. and shooting that. And that was good. And then we shot every kind of missile that you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And then we had missile shoots as well. I probably shot 20... 25 sidewinders and about eight, nine sparrow missiles. You know, so, and the day I got got the MIG, I shot two. Mm -hmm. You know, if I if I'd had four of them and I'd, I'd still had the chance, I'd have <laughs> shot all four of them into them. You know, but it was but the Top Gun. It, it was also it was the strategies. It was a changing philosophy to make certain that you understood energy management and energy conservation, because both of those are critical for fighting your airplane against any other airplane, whether it's a high performance or it's a low performance. And you wanted to make certain that if it was a low performance, all you did was slashing attacks. You can then get yourself out of it, not fall into the trap trying to do a low speed hassle with them because they were going to eat your lunch. <laughs> yeah. So how long did you spend at Top Gun then? That was six weeks. The first one was six weeks. I'm not certain how long they are now. I think that they run about four weeks. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the current schedule. But it was uh, the first one was six weeks long, and uh, we flew every day. We'd have lectures in the morning, fly in the afternoon, or fly in the morning, lectures in the afternoon. It's quite intense, then. It's very intense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, very good. I loved it. And it, and every now and then you'd fly fly with one of the instructor our uh, radar intercept officers, and they they came to the table. They were very, very experienced, and, and they were basically fighters as well. Mm -hmm. And they could, they could tell you, you you're turning wrong. You, you, need, you, you need to tighten up and, and, uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was just good. It was yeah. just good. Sounds very good. Uh, but you also were a test pilot for the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Air Force. Could you tell us about this and some of the aircraft you flew? Yeah. I started off uh, flying in VF-142, and then the second cruise I was on, the uh, after it was just after Top Gun, we got a new lieutenant commander to come in who had been a test pilot, and he said to me one day, he said, "Bo, you ought to become a test pilot." He says, "You're a good pilot. We can use you. You got a good engineering background and so forth." So I applied for and was selected for that. And that gentleman's name, he went on to become an admiral, was Larry Blows, and unfortunately he died of cancer some years ago. But uh, uh, he was very good at putting me forward, and he he basically grandfathered me in, into TPS. So I went to TPS. TPS, we had 13 airplanes, uh, 14 airplanes. We had helicopters, I flew. I flew uh, a very old, um, what was it? It's like an F-86. It was a T-1A, uh, single engine jet, straight wings. But we could do uh, some really wild out of control flight with it. You could go up and what we were looking at and what we were being taught, and then I went on to teach it when I came back as an instructor, which was yaw roll pitch coupling, inertia coupling through the three axis. And we would do that generally at a lower speed, but uh, inertial ax, uh, inertial coupling can take place at very high speeds as well. And so you have to be really careful. You have to recognize what causes it and so forth. Then that was the T, T, uh, T1A, and then we had the uh, uh, XT26 powered glider, which was a Schweitzer 236 glider 
which and I ended up at the end the only one who would fly it. It was a, it had very it had a wooden propeller, and it had a Continental O two hundred engine in it, and it had five fan belts we used to buy from Western Auto to connect the engine to the to the propeller, and if you put up the power on too fast, too hard, it would start squeaking like fan belts do on cars, and you had to take all the power off and very gently put it back on again. So that was, that was the X-26 that we flew. And the next thing we had was had the T-2, and we did certain things in the T-2. We had the TA-4 Skyhawk. We had the Corsair. Uh, we had the OV-10, had the OV-1 Mohawk had T-28s, had the Otter and the Beaver, and I love flying the Otter and the Beaver, but especially the Beaver. It's an old tail dragger. You pump the flaps down. You pumped it to get it started and stuff like that. It was really, really cool. And we used that for towing gliders, as we also had regular gliders that we flew at the school, too. The wide variety of airplanes was, was so that we could see different airplane characteristics. Every All airplanes demonstrate the same characteristics, some more prominent than others. A glider, you get a lot of adverse yaw when you roll an airplane. You put the aileron in, you get a lot of adverse yaw, so you see the effect of using, using rudders and things like that. The Otter was an interesting thing. At 60 knots, you could put in left rudder to make the airplane roll to the left, is the, normally what they would do, but it would roll to the right. It would roll opposite. The T2 was similar. If you get up close to VMAX in the T2, you could put in right stick and it would roll left instead of rolling right. And the reason for that was is that the deflection of the aileron on the other wing was causing the wing to, to, to uh, bend adversely and you would roll the wrong way. So it was just things like that, that, that you, you had all these different kinds of airplanes that you learn the characteristics. And the single biggest thing, I think, more than anything else, is you learn yourself and how to take yourself out of the equation so that what you're looking at is pure airplane response and not you jiggery pokery doing something. So it's, it's just that sort of thing. It's very, it was very, very interesting and very challenging. Um, I liked doing it. And, uh, and I, I went and did ordnance separation after TPS, but then they seconded me back to the school as a flight instructor um, after two years, and so I, I did two years on the staff at uh, at TPS. Then, when I finished my tour with the Royal Navy in 1976, I had orders to War College uh, and a, another department head job before I screened for command. And when I laid out all of this to my new bride and said, I'm going to be at sea for the next four to five years, plus you're not going to see much of me while I'm going to more college because that's a grind. She said, well, maybe we need to, that ain't going to work for her, and maybe we need to look at something else. So I said, well, I can retire on 20 years, and I'm quite happy to do that and, and have a life, and we wanted to have a family, which we eventually had a daughter. And so I told the Navy I was going to retire at, on 20 years, and so they sent me to the Air Force Test Pilot School as the Navy flight instructor. And that was an interesting thing. And there I got a chance to fly everything. I flew F-15s. I flew uh, the F-100. I flew all the Century Series fighters except the, the 105. It was down the day I was meant to fly it. And then I flew the, the Phantom, the T-38, the A-37. Um, and anything I could get my hands on, I flew. <laughs> yeah. And all told, in my career, I've flown... 69 different types and kinds of airplanes and all but two models of the Phantom. I never flew the German version of it. I did fly the Iranian version of it and I never flew the Japanese version of the Phantom. And all the rest of them I flew and it was good. Some of the RF, the, the RFC, the uh, RFB, uh, which was the, the Marine version and, uh, and the, that was me, you know, the C to D, the E, the F. I didn't fly the F but the, uh, the Iranian version, and so forth. So. I have to ask, did you have a favorite? It's probably hard to choose. Oh, I've got three airplanes I loved. I loved the Phantom for combat. I loved the OV-10 for low-level messing around, and the Beaver for just dinking. 
I loved all M types, the F fifteens, the F fourteens. Yeah, this that, that, that I, I just would go back to the Phantom, and I love flying the OV ten low level out there in the Chesapeake over on the far side of the Chesapeake Bay when I was at Patuxent River, and there's there'd be just creeks and stuff that you'd just fly down. I'd be flying about 10, 15 feet off the water. Really? He was up in the mountain. Yeah. <laughs>Can you t tell us about your exchange with the Royal Navy and how this happened? Well, when I was getting ready to leave Patuxent River, uh, I'd been a landing signal officer in my squadron, VF-142, controlling the flight deck. And I liked doing that, but they were going to send me to the Saratoga on the East Coast. And in Saratoga, I didn't, I didn't like the way they did the LSO platform on that. And I was going to be CAG LSO for know, CAG 6 or something, or CAG 5. And... Uh, I said, I, I, I didn't really want to do that. And they said, well, we, you've, we've got a great exchange duty with the Royal Navy flying Phantoms, the F-4Ks. And I said, be delighted to do that. And so I got selected for that, went to culture school. And, uh, culture school? <laughs> yeah, they've got, a, they've got four weeks of culture training. Okay. How to, how to deal with people of different cultures. Right. What to do, what not to do. And... Uh, it, it, it was well worth doing, and it was fun too. But you know, but so I came over and flew with uh, with uh, 892 Squadron here at Lukers, and then aboard HMS Ark Royal. And Ark Royal was a real treat because they had a bar, <laughs> and you could have wine with dinner. <laughs> so, so what are the main differences between the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy? Royal Navy pretty much is a flying club. Everybody knew everybody because we're we're down to it, about three carriers and and. Not that many aviators and stuff like that. And the fighter pilots, they were a very limited number. We only had one squadron of fighters left when I joined of, of, the, uh, of the Phantom. And uh, it, it was just basically a flying club. Mm -hmm. Very relaxed. The rules weren't very aggressive. We could do low levels. We could go beat up other ships and stuff like that. And, uh, and it, nobody minded as long as you were subsonic when you went by them. <laughs> They didn't want you to blow windows out of the bridge. So, <laughs> so what were the, dif oh, well, the differences between uh, the U.S. models and the British models with the Spay? Well, the, the, what I felt more than anything is that the Spay engine, because it's a fan engine, really uh, wasn't good for the Phantom because it made the, it made the airplane uh, more difficult to land on a carrier because you'd put on power and it would hesitate and it would come on, and you always seemed like you were choo-chooing. You were putting too much on, taking too much off. Also, because the Phantom had had boundary layer control, we blow, blew high-pressure air over the wing, over the flaps. That gave us more lift and allowed us to fly slower. But when you put power on, you got more lift. You took power off, you got less lift. So with the fan engine, that inherent delay just seemed like it aggravated the smoothness that you had. With the American Phantom, you could trim that thing up just trim it and just walk the throttles, and it was absolutely beautiful on the carrier. You know, especially at night, it was just took a lot of the sweat and worry out of <laughs> out of landing the carrier at night. Okay. You know, so. So how did uh, carrier operations differ to the U.S.? Well, it it kind of when they made up their mind they were going to fly in the Royal Navy, they were going to fly come hell or high water. And uh, it, I spent more time holding because we, we launched on the second flight and the first flight couldn't get back on board the ship or I was in the first flight and I couldn't get back on board the ship because something wrong with the ship. And they would just, once they decided they were going to do that, that was it. Another thing that was really fun is we had cocktail parties when we pulled into port <laughs> with the Ark Royal. We'd have, all these people would come on board and, and it, was, it was a gas. And uh, the rest of it, in terms of how we flew, pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. Pretty much the same. The tactics, pretty much the same. You know, we did more air to ground and more low level in the British Phantom than we did in the American Phantom. And that's because of the weather patterns here in Scotland and Europe and so forth. And in their, say, their, their area that we're going to have to do if they were doing something in East Germany or someplace like that, the weather factor, the weather tends to be lower. Mm -hmm. And so you had a little bit different air to ground mode as well different rockets as well so did you ever conduct any DACT with your American colleagues oh yeah yeah when I with both uh, 
in both instances, both when I was in the U.S. Navy, uh, flying against other people, mm -hmm. and then also in the uh, in the Royal Navy, we, when we made an American cruise, we operated off of Oceana, and we would go and fight with the aggressor squadrons, and that was that was really interesting, and they they, they could tell when you had your stuff together and when you didn't have your stuff <laughs> together, but it was good. It was good, and the thing was the RAF. We had RAF pilots is, is part of our squadron, and they were good young people. And they, they were the young stock that were coming in. You know, the, the, uh, the rest of us were all, you know, older and been around for a while. Mm -hmm. so. so how long did you spend with the Royal Navy, and did you enjoy it? Two and a half years, and I enjoyed the, the pieces. We still, they have in October of each year down in Wales, we have the Gash Hands Thrash, which is all the rascals, show up. And we, this last one, last October, we had about 50 people that showed up. And we do a two-day uh, thing. We do some seminars, and we, and we have a, a gash hands dinner the, both nights. And it's, and it's good fun. I've put together different, view, you know, different slide programs or, or videos that could run on the, on the camera all the time. Mm -hmm. you know, so we had, and I had stuff from Ark Royal. I had stuff from other carriers, and I just put it all on, along with American stuff as well. So mm -hmm. it was very good, very good. So overall, did you enjoy your flying career? I did. I enjoyed it very much. I have been back, and I did a little bit of flying and test flying when I was worked for a company out in, in Washington State, uh, developing some of the algorithms for the um, combat or for the ground proximity warning systems for military airplanes. So I helped develop some of that and did some training with those guys, uh, tra tra teaching their test pilots how to fly combat missions. And so that was good. Uh, I've often, I was going to, when I turned 50, I was going to buy a Warbird. And my wife, bless her heart, said, can we afford it? I said, yeah, we'll sell one of our flats and I'll buy it and, and, and we'll, we, I can afford it. What would you get? Well, I'd either get a P, P-38 Lightning or a P-40 Warhawk. I fancy that. Or if I could get one and I could afford it, I'd get a F-4U Corsair. Oh. That was always one of my favorite airplanes. Anyway, the gull wing. The, then she says, uh, what would you do with it? I said, well, I'd fly in some air shows and stuff, and, you know, they'll, they'll pay me, put the fuel in for me to come down and, and fly in the air show. Nothing, nothing dramatic, just high-speed pass, make lots of noise, do some loops and aileron rolls, and you don't have to do that much. And she says, well, how many people will it carry? And I said, one. She said... <laughs> Yep, we don't need one then. <laughs> and that was the end of <laughs> my warbird. <laughs> I would have been cool if you didn't get it, though. Oh, my. <laughs>
uh, it's it it has such good things to do, mm -hmm. and I'm just so excited about doing it. And we're getting support from everybody. And it's just a case of getting our funding together and working that. And it's about forty five thousand pounds I need to get started for the next two years. So, so is there an aircraft you wish you could have flown? Well, there's a probably two or three I would have liked I would have liked to have flown. I'd have liked to have flown the Raptor, mm. the the uh, F twenty two. I would have liked to have flown that because they were testing that when I was at Edwards and I could never figure out how to get my fingers into that. Mm. Uh, there's maybe one or two stealth things I would have liked to have flown just to, just to see, to look at the flight characteristics of them. And, and I would like to fly a tornado, or not a tornado, but a, uh, I've flown a tornado simulator, but fly the uh, typhoon? typhoon, yeah. And I, I fancied that, mm. you know. Quite a nice jam. I'm guessing you quite you see them quite often around here. Yeah, they come down now that Lucre's become a, an army base. They they come down from from Lossy Mouth and shoot approaches. So yeah. you see them down here. So, yeah. so Jerry, do you ever get sick of talking about aviation? Not really. <laughs> My wife, uh, when when I went on the uh, two seat Spitfire, what I didn't realize they had a a camera that was videoing my face for oh. the entire flight. And afterwards, what they did is they gave me uh, the camera, the, the, the video to the, to the flight. And it was about a week later when we were back home that I actually put them on my computer and ran them. And I called my wife in, and what I hadn't, didn't realize when I was flying the airplane is I never stopped moving my head. My head was all over the place, <laughs> looking up, looking down, sideways, and so forth. And I said to her, I said, Look at this. I said, I've never stopped moving my head. And she says, you never stopped talking either. <laughs> so no, I never tire of talking about aviation. It's just good fun. Well, Jerry, thanks very much for being on the show. Well, thank you very much for coming up. Take care. <laughs>